Ken Milne here for Cape 19, a talk between two lobsters. And I have to say, uh, before I introduce our extra special guest here, when we came up with the concept of a talk between two lobsters, you know what song's been going through my head? The B-52. The B-52's Rock Lobster. So I'm going to try to get that out of my head and focus directly on Team Vank. Yes, we have Team Vank here. This is one of the most outstanding Canadian researchers coming out of Ottawa. There's a few researchers out of Ottawa. Um, I can never remember what that one guy's name is, but he's got all these rules and things. And then of course Jeff, he's so nice, isn't he? Yeah, so Team Vank, welcome to Cape 19. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Now, uh, we just want to do our, a, a few questions and one of the questions is, what are the big papers that have been published recently? So, uh, we have published three papers recently. The most important one is the one in circulation, uh, which tells you how long we monitor patients with syncope uh, who present to the emergency department. How long do you monitor them in the emergency and how long do you need to monitor them when they leave the emergency department. So, uh, that study shows that and you classify them as like low, medium, and high risk. As so the low, risk score, medium, and high risk patients, yes. As per the Canadian syncope risk score, and then if they are low, observe them for two hours, discharge them. If you don't find any other thing, these are for arrhythmias. Only. So if you're thinking about arrhythmias in these patients, two hours of observation in the emergency department is enough. So low risk patients concerned about arrhythmias monitor for two hours. Medium risk patients, concerned for arrhythmias, monitor them for six hours. Six hours. And high risk patients, monitor them for six hours in the emergency department. The medium risk patients, you can observe them. You don't have to put them on a monitor. The low and the medium risk patients, when they, if they develop some symptoms, like you know, dizziness, feel weak, like feel like I'm going to faint, Either get an ECG right away or connect them to the monitor at that time because we don't have enough monitor beds for resources. Yes. So, only high risk patients, which will be 5% of all of the patients present in the syncope, who will need monitoring for a duration of six hours. The medium and the high risk patients are still a little bit higher risk when you discharge them home. Mm -hmm. So, put them on a monitor for the next 15 days. A couple of weeks? Yeah. And then that will help us to identify any underlying arrhythmia that is important, that may be related to the syncope, that can be detected. One more point, just in case if all of your assessment is completely done and if you have availability facilities to monitor these patients mm -hmm. as outpatient, you don't want, you don't have to wait for six hours. Because they're going to be monitored, you can just discharge them at the end of two hours. You, know, you just do a brief evaluation. Mm -hmm. You're not worried about non arrhythmic conditions that you need to investigate no CTPs, no CTs of the head, and no CTs of the abdomen that you're worried about, like anything acute going on. You can still discharge them and they can be monitored as outpatient. All right, so that's paper number one published in circulation about monitoring syncope patients. Yes. Paper number two about the Bessit study. Oh. How could people forget the Pesset study? When it was published, there was a collective scream from the FOMED world, and uh, uh, let me just try to recreate it. No! Yes, it's a no. <laughs> so, well, you remember the scare that it created that one-sixth of all patients, about 16% of all patients with syncope had an underlying PE. We combined two large data, prospectively collected data of syncope patients from the US and Canada, 17 emergency departments across North America, 9,000 patients. Can you guess what the prevalence is? Um, let me see, was it 16%? Lower, 10%? Um, five, my favorite number percent? Well, maybe p-value five, <laughs> lower. Lower, okay, 1%? Lower. So the rate of PE observed in these prospective studies was less than 1%. 1%. Wow. It's about around half a percent. And I shouldn't be surprised because, you know, when the PESIT study came out and we were all reading this 16%, we were like, wait a minute, that's not my clinical experience. And I have to say, less than 1% would correlate very closely to my clinical experience. Exactly. So no need to investigate the yin yang PE on your syncope patients. Select your patients based upon you. Did you say just up, investigate up and down the yin yang? Yes. Don't, don't, don't investigate overall a lot <laughs> for your syncope patients, particularly 
don't investigate a lot for PE among your CKP patients until otherwise you have a good clinical yeah. suspicion. Sure, no, if you're clinically suspicious, if you've got the big leg, if you've got other clinical things that say, I need to go down this path and that person could have had a syncopal <laughs> episode because of that but not the other way. You syncopized, you have to be ruled out for PE. That's no. not the message that we should be given. Okay, so that's the second paper. What, you've got a third big publication recently? Third one is just recently out this week in Academic Emergency Medicine. Oh, Academic Emergency Medicine. One of my favorite journals, um, Conflicts of Interest. I am one of the editors. Oh, it is one of my favorite journals. Though. Yes. Um, we published it quite a bit. In the it's a great journal. So it's a systematic review on uh, proportion of patients who are getting CT of the head for syncope in our emergency departments and when they get admitted to the hospital and what is the yield of the CT of the head. So you're looking at the yield of patients who uh, either are discharged or admitted that get a CT when the diagnosis is syncope. Exactly. What's the yield? So in the emergency department across all of these studies 5% of patients have a CT of the head. The yield is about 3.8%. And uh, among those who are admitted to hospital, hospitalized with CT, around 50% again got CT of the Half of them got their head scan? Head scan by the admitting physician. And their yield is about 1%. So we also have some risk factors that are associated with finding something abnormal in the CT of the head. So if they have some neurological symptoms, had a previous stroke, if they have been, if they are on antiquarians, uh, then they are at higher risk of having something mm -hmm. So how can you use this? Overall, the yield is about two to three percent for, okay. for all patients who will get the CT of the head. So if you have none of these risk factors, it's probably quite low, like you know, less than one percent. And if you have several of these risk factors, probably the risk is quite higher. If you have these risk factors, yes, go ahead and do a CT. If there is not, just talk to your patient. Say that they are at lower risk. Ask them to watch for signs and symptoms of neurological symptoms, headaches, reduce level of alertness, vomiting, any of those things. And they come back and they get a CT done. Let's do it. Let's practice medicine by testing glands. A Canadian thing. <laughs> a Canadian thing, yeah. Sometimes less is more. But I'm going to use this as an advantage to talk about evidence-based medicine for just a brief moment because you've talked about three different studies. And, you know, the literature in an evidence-based model, the literature informs our care, but it doesn't say, thou shalt do this, thou shalt not do that. It informs our care, but it doesn't dictate our care. We sti still need to use this, our clinical judgment, Right? And most importantly, we have to sit down and say, okay, well, these are the numbers, this is what the research shows, but talk to the patient and say, what do you value? What is your preference? Because their level of risk and, and assuming certain levels of risk may be different from what we would assume. So you say, well, it's gonna be between one, two, three percent, somewhere in there, what would you like to do? Exactly, so patient's preference number one, and then physician is informed by these evidence-based guidelines and when you are in a dilemma as what you need to do then use the evidence yeah use the evidence to inform and guide your care and engage the patient but don't forget your clinical judgment is important in this whole evidence-based model so those are three papers that you're uh, that you've just published what are you working on now can you tell us what's what's coming down the pipe yes it's Validation of oh, the oh, oh, this are, we, are, are, are we allowed to say this? Is it That's just why I'm just close oh, to Oh, you're close. This is just between us, okay? What is it? Validation of the Canadian syncopated score. You're going to have a validated score, which is going to tell you what is the chance of your patient dying? What is the chance of your patient suffering a ventricular arrhythmia? What is the chance of your patient suffering a non ventricular arrhythmia? And what is the chance of other non arrhythmic conditions like intracranial, like bleeding. Uh, this is going to inform you as to what you need to do. Remember, first study that I talked about, you can just eliminate several of the arrhythmias by means of monitoring. Now we are going to look at a small proportion of patients who 
we just need to detect none of them. And based upon that, you can decide whether you need to admit them or not admit them. That's coming down the pipe. Okay, so where can we look for, where will it be published? So, we're going to submit it in Lancet, let's see. It will be somewhere, Lancet, JAMA, BMJ, hopefully. Okay, well, um, I'm going to make you commit to something when it gets published, because it will get published, and it's great to see a validation study being published, not just a derivation set, but a validation study being published. When it is published, will you agree to come on the Skeptic's Guide to Emergency Medicine and discuss it? Absolutely. Because you have That's an open invitation. Thank you for all the knowledge transmission that you do, because it has made life easier for us, like, you know. Literature shows that it takes 10 years for knowledge translation. People like you and other people from podcasts and the younger generation who are pretty tech savvy has made this knowledge translation time well, quite a bit easier. You're, you're creating the content and I'm happy to critically appraise it, be skeptical of it, but also be part of the dissemination of it. But that brings up an important point before we finish off. It's called Team Vank. I mean, you are not just one person doing this. It is a team. This is a shout out to my team. I did not create this name, Team Vank. It was all of my research staff who created this, and they created a Twitter account to just like disseminate some of the information. Um, I have not been actually directly tweeting on Team Bank for several years. He's got, he's, he's got people to tweet <laughs> for him. All the tweets that I do come from me, people. But he's got people that tweet for Team Bank. Uh, no, I am tweeting. <laughs> Are you? Okay. Yes, I am. So um, I am learning. But you have a great group there in Ottawa as a team producing this literature and, and you're creating this whole pipeline of people with this mentorship program starting with that Dr. S, he who shall not be named, um, Jeff Perry and of course uh, Team Vank. You're creating this pipeline and mentorship of uh, future researchers. Yeah, so mentorship is quite important. That is something that would be uh, of great value to me and pretty important to pass it on to the younger generation. So I have a great team of uh, members who have been part of my team who have moved on successfully to various, uh, they are highly qualified professionals in various organizations at the present time, including physicians who have completed emergency medicine and public health residency, those kind of stuff. And I have a new team. It's, I am nothing without my team. <laughs> Thank so, uh, one final thing before we wrap up this talk between two lobsters, and that is next year, Cape 2020 is going to be in your hometown of Ottawa. So, uh, my ask is, where's the swag? Where's the team wear? Where's the stuff that says Team Vank? So, when I come to Ottawa in 2020, can I get a Team Vank t-shirt or something? We are going to do it. Go I think like, it's time to do it, like, you know, Team Vank Oh, uh, we need to brand it. We, we need we'll Team Vank. Let's do it. Go Team Bank. Go Team Bank.